Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox and I'd like to welcome you to episode two of Unfair and Unbalanced, a podcast with Roy Snell and Tom Fox. In this episode, Roy and I take a look at uh, several different things. The first of all, the terror attacks in Paris and how compliance can be used to combat worldwide terrorism. Why Roy dislikes the Pointer Sisters and why I like Bob Dylan's finger pointing songs. I uh, wax a little philosophical with some Hegelian dialectic. We talk about Leslie Caldwell and the Department of Justice's decision to appoint a compliance council. We talk about changes in the DOJ's enforcement strategy for FCPA uh, cases to encourage organizations to cooperate and disclose. And we end with the myth of the rogue employee. The episode comes in at just over 27 minutes. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much for listening. and I'd like to welcome you to this episode of Snell and Fox, Unfair and Unbalanced, where myself, Tom Fox, visits with Roy Snell, the CEO of the Society of Corporate Compliance and Ethics, or the SCCE, on a wide range of compliance topics. Uh, Roy, welcome back. Uh, it's good to be here, Tom. You know, we got uh, going a little bit there at the end of our last uh, podcast, and I think we both uh, decided that it was something we wanted to explore further. You started it by pitching me a question about uh, some of my thoughts around um, corruption and the tragedy in Paris over the past uh, few days, Uh, and uh, I gave uh, a little bit of an answer that really synthesizes down to what I see as a business solution to a legal problem. But you've actually been thinking about this and talking about this as well. So uh, why don't you tell us about your thoughts? Well, your point was that uh, corruption makes it difficult for people to effectively battle many things, in, including terrorism. Um, and, and you gave some great examples. I uh, want to just mention very briefly that I think compliance programs, and I'm sure you would agree, are a great tool to help fight uh, uh, corruption and make sure that the rule of law associated with FCPA is, is followed. And about 10 years ago, I was asked by the UN to go speak in Warsaw on a panel about problems associated with corruption. And uh, there were two people from many, many different countries in attendance. And people from all over the world were listening. And as as it is in many other countries, there is less didactic lecture and more discussion. So we got done with our panel. I did my five minutes on, uh, you know, and preventing, finding, and fixing these problems with the use of auditing, monitoring, investigations, risk assessments, hotlines, and, and essentially I talked about compliance program as a solution. I, I really tried to emphasize, I hear your frustration. I understand the problems that corruption causes around the world. And if you hire a compliance officer and implement a compliance program, you're going to have a better chance of preventing, finding, and fixing corruption. And as soon as I was done, one person after another got up and completely ignored the potential solution and started telling us about the horrible problems they face. And after about 15 of these sessions that I considered whining and not solutions, I just wanted to scream, is anybody here care to take action? We got the, uh, the picture, we get the, the, the point, the, the corruption is here. We don't need any more examples. And I just find it frustrating that you know, I'm sure you're frustrated that, that corruption is not fought hard enough all over the world. I am frustrated that uh, compliance programs aren't implemented to help with following the rule of law like corruption around the world. Um, but I'm really going to make a point here that I'm, I'm kind of sick and tired of the whiners. I'm, 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 I'm 
tired of the people who point fingers. I'm, I call them the pointer sisters. You know, the, the problem over there, there's a problem over there. This company, you know, some company goes down and, and you see uh, people tweeting and putting things on LinkedIn and blogs that, oh, they're horrible, they're horrible. What about the solution? I want more people to talk about the solution. If you want to find people in our profession that have substance, I got an idea for you. Go on to Twitter, if they have a Twitter account, and look at the last 50 tweets. If it's just one more piece of finger pointing and whining about the latest bad guy, unfollow them. Don't look to them for leadership. If on the other hand, they're, they're, and you can do this with blog posts, LinkedIn posts, if their last 10 posts, their last 50 tweets are about solutions, and about preventing, finding, and f fixing problems, and the occasional finger pointing, we all do. Um, follow them, listen to them. I beg everybody listening to start paying attention to the overall substance of those purporting to be leaders in our profession. If all they do is whine and point an accusatory ethical finger at other people, we don't need their help. We get it. There's a problem. We need solutions. Well, as always, I find your point interesting. <laughs> Not necessarily effective? No, very effective. But my, uh, I guess my thought would be uh, we do need those finger pointers. And uh, we may disagree with them. We may think they whine too much. We may um, get tired of reading what they say, but I think everybody has a role. And I think uh, that finger pointers, certainly in my, my case, they cause me to challenge my own thoughts and beliefs and make me articulate a response to their finger pointing. Uh, I like your pointer sisters because uh, early Bob Dylan songs, uh, he called them his finger pointing songs. And they were really songs of protest. Yeah. Um, but I think that there's a role for that. And because our profession is is not in its infancy, but we're we're not a mature profession right. like the legal profession. In many ways, we're still sort of finding our way as right. a profession. And uh, I think finger pointers and finger pointing can point out things that need to be addressed by the greater community. So uh, I do get tired of whining, and I do get tired of it, but I think there's a, still a role for that um, in, uh, in our overall profession. Yeah, and, and here's, I, I, that's why I like disagreement, because it leads to clarification. My point, better said, is that for every person with a real solution in the world, not just this country, a real solution like setting up the rule of law and enforcing it and implementing compliance programs in our companies to prevent, find, and fix problems. For every one person who's pointing the finger, or for every one person who is, is, is uh, forwarding a, an effective solution, there are 10,000 finger pointers. Um, so I word it in an exasperated way and over the top to make a point that I could make better, and you bring that out in me, is that it's not that we don't need finger pointers, but we have ten, hun, uh, millions of, of finger pointers around the world. And we have tens of thousands, at least in the compliance profession, providing what I believe is the most elegant solution. Um, and what I fear the most is that those who came before us thought that finger pointing was the answer, literally. I, I think a lot of academic ethicists just said if we, if we complain enough, uh, the problem will be fixed. If we tell people to do the right thing enough, it, the problem will be fixed. And it, it's just uh, history, tens of thousands of years of history have, have taught us that values and principles and Asking people to have them isn't enough. If you really want them, you got to enforce them. Uh, so the biggest picture of all this, the, the greatest concern I have, 
is that the people who espouse the solution in the past of, of, of just whining are trying to and may take over this solution because they believe that whining is a solution. Um, and it's not that I disagree. I don't disagree at all. I believe that finger pointing, if we didn't have it, compliance wouldn't be here. The enforcement communities pointing a finger, the press, the public, the politicians, everybody's pointing fingers. It's, if, it was, if it wasn't there, we, we couldn't convince people to implement compliance programs. My problem is with just the sheer number of them and, the, and, and how few of us there are that are actually trying to fix the problem. And I really, 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 and I want to leave everybody with this thought, I really, really, really do not want the finger pointers to take back over our profession. And uh, I want to leave it in the hands of the nuts and bolts, turn over the rock compliance professionals. Well, I would certainly agree with that, but I've always wanted to go philosophical in a podcast, so you've given me the opportunity. Excellent. Because I think, uh, I think of it in terms of the Hegelian dialectic of uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And I see that as a constantly uh, evolving. And uh, I guess the, if there are a million finger pointers out there, it, to me it's so much white noise, and I don't hear it. Uh, and I focus on what are the solutions or at least what are the lessons that we can learn going forward. Yeah, it's, uh, it's going to take everybody. Uh, it's, it, we need all the pieces. We need ethics and risk and legal and audit. And, and we need the folks that start nonprofits that scream from, as loud as they can from the highest mountaintop that we have problems and we need the compliance profession. I just am such a homer. I don't drink. The, I don't drink the Kool Aid. I, I, I inject the Kool Aid. It's. It, I want to. I want to push this as hard as I can. I want to ask you, Tom, about Leslie uh, Caldwell has been in the news uh, quite a bit lately. Uh, talking about the compliance uh, legal counsel. The compliance council. That compliance they, council, they, yes, they, for they, the Department of Justice. Hired and some other things going on there. And then after that, I think we should talk a little bit about some things you've heard lately about the DOJ. Uh, sure. Um, so this past summer, a news story broke that the Department of Justice was hiring a compliance council to help the department evaluate corporate compliance programs. This compliance council was identified. Uh, she is a... Um, former DOJer, former in-house for high level and compliance in a couple of corporations, I think Microsoft and HSBC. I think the person has now gone to work formally, formally been hired by the Department of Justice. And uh, there was uh, a story broke in August or September, but there was a fair amount of commentary about the uh, efficacy of the department having a subject matter expert advising them. And I know you had some, some fairly, you have some fairly strong thoughts on that. And I guess mine are, that uh, any time you can bring uh, additional expertise to uh, any subject, that, that that's a generally a good thing. Um, many prosecutors are very good prosecutors, and they're very smart lawyers generally, so they can learn compliance, but that's not their primary job. Their primary job is, is to prosecute under the law. And if they can hire someone who really... Uh, can evaluate a corporate compliance program and give them advice. I think that's a, a positive step forward. I, I agree. You know, we're not we're gonna we're not gonna find too much disagreement here. Uh, I, I saw one comment about uh, the fact that it wasn't needed that this hiring wasn't needed because the DOJ already has a lot of compliance experience compliance program evaluation experience. What sure. Was, what, do you, what is your thought? There? I guess you're talking about Mike Volkoff's blog on that point. He did, he did bring that up, yeah. Yes, uh, I disagree. <laughs> I, just, I think it's additional resource for the department and that's a subject matter expert. Uh, yes, they do have a lot of knowledge about compliance. Uh, one of the things that I found interesting in my own journey and my own evolution is to watch the department evolve. And they're knowledge has grown as they have prosecuted more and more cases and certainly they have become more sophisticated but um, I think uh, by having a, a true subject matter expert in this field 
uh, who's available to them, I think that that could uh, assist the department going forward. So I have to say I disagree with Mike yeah. on that one. And, and I think that's the beauty of you and I debating this. Uh, quite often I, I receive criticism or disagreement and I realize I just haven't made my, I agree with the comment. Yeah, I agree with the disagreement. I, I just haven't made my point very clear. And maybe Michael uh, could explain it. And, and w one of the thoughts might be, as his perspective might be a little bit different, I don't know. Uh, I'm certainly sure that the DOJ has plenty of people who understand the fundamentals of a compliance program. W where I might disagree is that I think there is a material difference between someone who has r read a bunch about compliance programs versus someone who has run one or sure. been in the compliance department like she has. And I was absolutely thrilled with their pick, uh, where I set the bar, excuse me, is, uh, was very specific. I said, please, please pick anybody who's ever been in a compliance department because all these people who have a legal background, risk background, audit background, but never been in a compliance department, it would be like picking a general counsel who's never been in the legal profession. Maybe that's too extreme, but it's, it's, I can't tell people how to run a general counsel's office because I've never been a general counsel. Even if I had a law degree, I shouldn't do it. Uh, but for some reason, the world expects, uh, thinks that people can speak for our profession or heaven forbid do one of the most difficult things there are is evaluate the effectiveness of a compliance program having never run one. <laughs> the, the DOJ has hired an individual who has worked in a compliance department. It is profoundly helpful uh, to, to all, all of us, in my opinion. And I, I, I'm, I'm just assuming that the point Mike is, is making is, is, is somewhat different. And if he was here, he'd be able to clarify it. Um, related to that, you had told me that there's some rumors about the Department of Justice and compliance programs. Yeah, uh, last week the Washington Pro Post had a story about uh, a memo and in, uh, an, an internal debate going on in the Department of Justice around uh, enforcement of the FCPA and perhaps a change in strategy where if a corporation uh, self-disclosed and fully cooperated, uh, during the pendency of uh, an investigation and then either had or put in a best practices compliance program, uh, that would be given considerable weight uh, by uh, a prosecutor making a decision to uh, bring an enforcement action up to and including just a, a pass or a declination. Um, this would be a, a pretty big change, I think, uh, from what the department currently says and does. Uh, really, uh, it's not we haven't seen the memo, so we don't really understand the parameters of it or if it will come to pass. Um, but uh, I found it interesting, particularly in light of the Yates memo, uh, where if uh, our listeners will recall, that was a Department of Justice memo released in September where they indicated that the DOJ would go after more individuals and try to prosecute individuals rather than bring uh, large corporate uh, right. enforcement actions. And if we bookend the Yates memo with this change, to me it's, it shows the department's thinking evolving and it shows that corporations can get real credit for not only self-disclosing, not only cooperating, but having a compliance program in place. And I think many corporations have not understood what the benefits of those three things are. Mm -hmm. um, here's where I'm coming from on this. And I hope that these rumors are true. But if you take it back 20 years ago, maybe a little bit more, society asked us to implement compliance programs. It has taken a great deal of money. It has been very difficult for those who have been uh, taken on these difficult roles. Um, and at some point, those that asked us to implement compliance programs in business have to reward the effort. Now, I've talked to people in enforcement. I've listened to people in enforcement. I completely understand the difficult position they're put in related to 
an issue associated with the compliance program defense or where people say, I get a free pass on anything because I put in a compliance program. We're not going to get that. We shouldn't have that. But credit should be given in some way. Recognition should be given in some way of the billions, I don't know, of dollars spent over the last 20 years, the incredible effort that 55 different industries have, have done this. Uh, this idea is so great, it's spreading a, a, around the world. Uh, it's been a great success, uh, but th there is little recognition of the, of the effort. I know it's difficult for the DOJ, but on the other hand, they're kind of the people that have to recognize it. I mean, if recognition from anybody else doesn't really mean much. Recognition from the enforcement community is telling leadership that the people that really, really spend a lot of time on this and are really concerned about this recognize the importance of the effort. I don't care how they do it. I don't care uh, if they they don't do it the way people are asking them to do it. I just care that they do it somehow. There has to be a way for the Department of Justice to acknowledge publicly the effort that's going on in a meaningful way without putting themselves in a bind. Well, this certainly uh, could be uh, a way uh, for that to happen. The um I guess the thing that struck me when I read it is twofold. One is it seems to me to be, like I've said, a, a companion to the Yates change. But the other thing is uh, it shows, I think, that, that the department evolves, its thinking evolves, and most importantly, that it listens. Yeah. It has listened to people like you. It has listened to the business community. Uh, and if it, even if it doesn't make a change, at least is listening and considering those points. Yeah, and, and we should acknowledge that there are folks out on the speaking tour from the enforcement community, not just the Department of Justice, that are supporting compliance programs. Uh, they, the SEC made a huge statement uh, when they released their findings of the Morgan Stanley investigation on FCPA. Uh, they said that the company had gone uh, beyond, well, they, 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 they had made a valiant effort to educate this individual and tell them not to bribe officials, and he did anyway. And, right. And, you know, there are cases when you ought to blame the company culture uh, for the quote-unquote rogue employee, and then... Uh, you know, Donna's going to personally come here and slap you after yeah, saying that. No, but, but, well, I'll, well, tell you you what, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you. But I want to. I want to hopefully bail myself out here. But I think we should get back to this rogue employee thing. But you can blame a company for the culture that creates the quote unquote rogue employee. Um, I think that's justifiable. If you tell everybody do whatever it takes, lie, cheat, and steal to get the job done and make sales or whatever. Uh, you should blame the company for that individual. On the flip side, in the Morgan Canley Stanley case, just this one example of one individual who was told dozens of times what the rule of law was with regard to bribery, and he did it anyways, I, I think you should go after the individual and le leave the company alone. Now, uh, to save uh, me from a peril here, <laughs> I, and I wrote it down actually before you told me I was heading down an interesting path, <laughs> Uh, let's talk about the rogue employee. Uh, it, 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 VW recently ran into, uh, not a brick wall, but the, the mother of all walls. Um, they have uh, made one of the greatest stumbles in the history of uh, stumbling. Um, and uh, a couple weeks ago, I saw them say, this was a few rogue employees. And I could just see smoke coming from the east uh, near where Donna lives. Uh, matter of fact, I forwarded, it to her. I forwarded it to her, and she wrote a little piece about it. What, what do you think about this concept of the, well, I don't know what people call it, the rogue employee defense? Uh, I don't think anything of it. I think it's, uh, there's no such thing as a rogue employee that uh, even if you uh, um, 
either you didn't train them, you didn't give them enough information, you didn't monitor yeah. on the detect prong. There's a variety of, of things you can and should do. Uh, where did that employee get the money to pay a bribe? Uh, short of CEO uh, or people in the C-suite, uh, there's almost no corporate employee that, that has enough cash on his own to pay a bribe to get a benefit that's going to benefit him in a material way or a meaningful way. That money has to come from the corporation somewhere, somehow, whether that's through outright fraud, whether that's through stuff in the channel, whether it's petty cash, whether it's an inflated contract and paying it back through a Swiss bank account, as we saw in Petrobras. Uh, if you look at the money trail, there should be a way to find uh, prevent uh, and detect uh, corporate fraud leading to bribery and corruption. Uh, in Morgan Stanley's case, I don't. Uh, I, I think they picked it up through their transaction monitoring. They certainly had given numerous uh, training sessions to the employee in question. He had certified that he hadn't violated the code of conduct. He had certified he hadn't violated the CPA. He had certified he is not in a conflict of interest with Morgan Stanley. So he had outright lied. So, uh, you know, Morgan Stanley and now Petra Tiger are the best two, or the only two public declinations we have. But uh, if it is a rogue employee, the question I would ask is how or where do they get the money to pay a bribe? Yeah, I, I think it's an excuse in a way, and I think that it is uh, probably <laughs> a legitimate answer in a few small, small percentage of the cases. Uh, maybe Morgan Stanley is an example, but I kind of agree with you, and I agree with the smoke rising from the east right now, Donna, ears burning, but... Uh, I'm referring to Donna Baum, who has fought this rogue employee excuse for years. Uh, I'm really, really, really supportive of it and, and with her. Uh, I think there might be a couple of cases where you could make the case that they tried and did everything. But I, I got to tell you, I got a weak argument here listening to you because they should have found him. They should have prevented him. They should have uh, sooner. And ultimately... I have the perspective, if you don't take on the perspective that the buck stops here, this, this, this company, the buck stops here at this company, we will accept no excuses. If somebody gets through our compliance program, if somebody gets through our gauntlet, it's on us. If you start to accept excuses, even if they have some legi legitimacy, you start to weaken the, 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 the argument or the, or the program, and I would prefer to say it's always on me if I'm the CEO. It's always my fault. You know, that seems like a good note for us to end on. This has been uh, really great, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks, Tom.